The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, January 13th, 2021, featuring Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science discussing inflation premiums. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You may also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Talking Data. It's a special edition today with Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. And today we'll be getting an update from Ben. We last spoke on December 15th about inflation, asking the question, is it here? Will it be coming shortly? And I think you have quite a few updates for us today, Ben. Um, The three components needed to foster an inflation premium within sovereign yields and risk assets were met in early October. Um, So where are we at now? Right. So we had this kind of big discussion all year last year talking about how we needed the global economy to come back, get 50 plus percent of economies growing. We needed the commodity market to bounce back, see 50 percent of commodities, uh, excluding energy to rally year over year. And then we needed investors to become comfortable with two plus percent headline inflation. Those were all fulfilled. And that's what we needed to start this real discussion of an inflation premium. So now that we're here, now that tips break evens across the curve have busted above 200 basis points, and now we even have talks from Fed officials of uh, desiring 2.5% core and headline inflation, the question is, what do we need now from investors, from economics here, to ensure that tips break evens will continue to widen and that this inflation story is legit and for real? So three things that we're going to talk about here during this discussion. One is... We've seen the tips break even curve invert. So if you look at inflation expectations from two years out to 30 years, the very short end, those inflation expectations are now uh, above the longer end. So next two years, our expectation is above 10 years, for instance. And that inverted curve, which is right around negative 25 basis points or so, is a very abnormal condition for inflation expectations that almost always mark a peak in them. So for this to be different, we're going to have to see the Fed commit to AIT, average inflation targeting, and potentially have to endure a break-even curve inversion enduring for a longer time than expected. The second thing is we need investors to raise the floor for headline CPI. We initially saw it at 1.5% through the maybe the middle of last year, and now in about a month or two ago, it was risen to about 2%. We need it to be risen to, uh, up to about two and a half percent. Right now, markets looking at inflation swap caps and floors are pricing in about a 30 percent probability two and a half percent headline CPI can be a reality. We need that or more from headline CPI because core PCI typically runs about 50 basis points lower. So to meet the Fed's target of that two percent, we're going to need that two and a half two and a half percent number on the headline basis. Thirdly, OER being such a huge component of CPI, that's owner's equivalent rent, that needs to round the corner. So we've seen nothing but a a falling, falling, falling level of of growth in rents. And we were able to tackle this issue of trying to determine when it will bottom by looking at overall apartment tightness, but more importantly, at search activity by consumers. So are they showing a uh, you know a, a more of an urge to rent to accept high you know accept the prices that they'll have to pay to do so and potentially are they seeing a dampening concern in you know big big issues like bankruptcies charge offs uh, and so on so we'll delve into that at the at the very end uh, but we can get things going uh, kind of by breaking into these uh, individual pieces if that's okay Kristen Oh, absolutely. Let's start talking about those tips for evens. They're under underperforming where risk assets should su- suggest that they should reside. Uh, what's causing this, Ben? This is, I think, kind of a conundrum for me. You know, we have so much, so many people in financial media and um, investors just kind of talking about the inflation story. Oh, how hot tips break evens are. But if you price them out, using just a simple model, which what we've done with crude oil, copper, implied volatility, liquidity, the dollar, and so on, you'll find that tips break evens should be much higher than uh, where they are. So we place them somewhere around 233 basis points. Right now we're you know just over 205 basis points. And that's and- changed that's changed recently, correct? That's gone up. Exactly. So with uh, equity markets still performing well, with commodities doing well, energy, 
and so on, we've seen that number continue to rise. And that's kind of the big issues. We have all these big good things happening within risk assets, but TIS break evens have only gotten back to that, you know, 200 basis point plus mark. So the question is, um, you know, what do we need to see investors get comfortable? And what do we need to see maybe to see that gap, a real inflation premium show up between where they currently are and where risk assets say they should be? So this kind of brings up, you know, liquidity uh, versus the um, idea of the inflation premium driving tips break evens, Kristen. Okay. And can you kind of walk us through this chart then? Um where you really do demonstrate that point, but maybe just dive a little bit deeper here. Sure, so the DKW model is probably one of the standards for decomposing TIS break evens, inflation expectations as a whole. And this is run through the end of last year. And so we break it into these three different components, expected inflation, which hasn't moved very much, you can see in the green line, the inflation risk premium, which is this inflation premium we're talking about right now, that remains horribly low. And then we also have here the liquidity premium. Now the liquidity premium is uh, really what we've talked about a lot since March of last year. So once the Fed got involved and owns, for example, 30 plus percent of some maturities further out the curve on the tips curve that is, they've had a big hand in dampening liquidity to the point where that premium that was positive, we inverted it here, has now become negative, meaning that they've made it so liquid that it's actually um, you know, it's actually become a positive number uh, in the tips break even itself, adding 34 basis points here, as you can see. So you can explain a lot of tips break evens widening almost exclusively by this liquidity premium. And Brainerd brought this subject up just um, uh, today or yesterday and discussing that we need to see us move beyond base effects and see a real inflation premium show up for the Fed to be comfortable and have this idea that they can taper or that they can raise rates uh, down the road. So they're saying, hey, slow down, not so fast. We're not going to see rate hikes. We're not gonna react like we have in the past. Bullard, I believe, just did that an hour ago from when we're speaking. So the big question is, again, do we get this inflation premium or not? And that kind of brings us to the market expectations, which I know Chris and all of us you know, with our clients have talked so much about how that two and a half percent hurdle is critical. And for now, uh, investors are apprehensive uh, about that level. I was gonna say, is 2.5% year over year back on the radar? It, it is, and I, I think that, you know, for the first time we're seeing inflation expectations liven. You know, you can see in this chart, this is essentially taking a call and a put option, looking at the premiums on headline CPI with a strike price of two and a half percent. So as we're able to then create a probability out of that. So as those premiums shift between the call and the put option, they're gonna demonstrate or reflect uh, the kind of the investor's belief and the probability that they have in headline inflation hitting that two and a half percent plus mark for the next two through 30 years, as you can see for each tenor here. And those have risen to about 30%. And what we really need to see is investors buy into the concept of two and a half percent inflation, which means they're gonna buy into the Fed, buy what the Fed is selling. And we need to see these probabilities get above 50%. So for anybody that's really apprehensive about the tips break even market inflation expectations in general, this is the chart for you. This is the metric for you. And this is what you'll want to see to say, hey, I'm gonna add to that position or boy, I missed the boat, should I be joining this? I've been very apprehensive this whole time. This is the confirmation that you would likely need to see. So the other thing too that we've um, uh, talked about is one caveat, one word of caution, uh, is this tips break even curve inversion. And this is a, as we talked about initially within this discussion, something that all investors in the inflation expectations should have in their mind. So if you look back in history, in this chart, you see all these dotted lines along with tips break evens, the two year and the 10 year above, and then the spread, basically the curve between two and 10 year tips break evens in the bottom. And you can see this inversion, and we've marked each inversion with these vertical lines. What do you see around these vertical lines? You see tips break evens peak, specifically short and tips break evens. And what this typically has meant is that we get these transitory, not to, I know it's a dirty word with the Fed, but the, these transitory bouts of inflation getting the short end inflation expectations to rise to the long end. And that's the end of it. 
poof, they're gone. Inflation expectations collapse at the short end, the, that curve re-steepens and so on. Right now, we are going to threaten really to see the most inverted tits break even curve since the financial crisis in 2008. And I think that in order for AIT to be kind of know that it's in place, we likely need to see this curve remain inverted for much longer than people expect. So either this is going to be it for inflation expectations for a while, or this time is different than any other period since the crisis. All right, next, so, why don't you walk us, I was going to say, next we're going to turn to global growth near the sweet spot. So good, how, what's the global impact? Good. Yeah, so the one of the developments we talked about last year was this quick rebound in global growth. It had started kind of with China. It's moved a lot more quickly than people believed it would. Uh, we've also seen the same thing happen with rebound in commodities. It could be tin, aluminum, copper, it could be grains, and so on. And what we've noticed is that if you look back historically and look at the percentage of economies across the globe that are growing, in this case right now it's right around 80%, and then the percentage of commodities, X energy, that are producing year-over-year -year gains, which are right now around 58%, where that is or where that resides typically is a very good indicator of what TIS break-evens should have done and what they will do. So right now, 10-year TIS break-evens are up about oh, 30 plus basis points on a year-over-year -year basis, which I know is going to remove all the insanity that we saw in between. But if we get this condition where we have, you know, 80% of economies growing above trend, which is meaning that they're producing economic data releases that are above their one-year averages, and we start to see 65, 70% of commodities rebounding on a year-over-year -year basis, which we're getting very close to, that typically means TIS break even should be up 100 plus basis points on a year over year basis. So again, there's further indications, just like risk assets say TIS break even should be wider. The global environment saying, oh, you know, inflation should be running, running better, running higher, but it's not. And I think that is the big conundrum and something we all kind of really think about uh, for the fact that we have this bifurcated situation. We've had goods inflation but really services continue to just remain um, in the pits. And then also rents, like we had discussed, remain very, very um, depressed in terms of its growth rate. Yeah, so this has been our leading indicator and I know you've done a great job um, covering off on OER. Um, so let's end today just really focusing on this as, as, as a leading indicator and uh, where, you, where you think it might take us. Yes, yeah, so like we've talked about, it's kind of the 800 pound gorilla that's you know weighing down headline and core inflation. You know, it comprises a roughly 25% of, of headline CPI and even more of core CPI. So it's it, this is the factor, the component that you really need to have swing higher to see inflation last. And it's not doing that right now. So here, updated today, we can see that OER continues to be led lower on a year-over-year -year basis, not lower, but the growth rate is lower on a year-over-year -year basis by the West Coast, surprise, surprise. Now, apartment tightness, which we can measure via the NMHC's index, has usually been a pretty good forward-looking metric. And what we've seen recently is uh, just this past month in December, apartment tightness uh, has actually started to increase from very easy levels. We'll see if that's something that can continue. Again, you can see it's not necessarily a perfect one-for-one -one match with OER. So we said, let's find something better to get a forecast and an, an idea of what OER is doing. And we look to search activity. So looking at Google, we can pull in you know, 50, 100 different topics uh, that relate to renting. We did that and we distilled it, basically took it down to the 35 most important and then we can figure out those that are favorable for rents and those that are unfavorable for rents going forward. And so the chart here shows you the search activity that has to do with favorable, you know, expecting higher rents. It's everything from people needing a one bedroom apartment to demographic transitions, uh, needing a lease, looking at leases and just kind of searching about them, uh, needing a U-Haul to move, vacation rentals and so on. And these numbers have started to appreciably improve um, as we got deeper into last year and now coming into this year, which says that the, the market is looking better and that we should potentially expect uh, higher prices. But on the flip side, some of the negative pressures that, you know, that correlate with lower rents still persist. And that has to do with things like bankruptcies, forbearance, late fees, unemployment benefits, which is no surprise. 
given the CARES Act and so on. And those still remain elevated. So here, the search activity, which I didn't explain this initially, but it's on a year over year basis, and we put them in the Z scores, is stacked. And you can still see that we are tilted heavily towards uh, still some pretty nasty negative search activity that would suggest prices won't rise. So how, do, how can we look at this? We have good stuff and bad stuff happening at the same time. If we take the median of the good stuff minus the median of the bad stuff for rents, we get this spread and this spread still tilts somewhat negative, meaning that uh, prices aren't necessarily at the point that they will rebound yet, but they're getting really darn close. So if you look back historically to the financial crisis, you can see the spread between good and bad search activity relating to rents does usually determine the direction of rental prices on a year over year basis. We've put it together a fancy model for those that like that, a random forest model, taking in all these 35 different search related terms and their topics and that their trends and determine right now there's about a 48% probability that, that OER on a year over year basis is higher, its growth rate is higher uh, one year from now, basically into January of 2022. So we're on the fence. So again, someone that's looking at this inflation story saying, maybe I've ridden this, uh, uh, it's been great, there's been fantastic returns, this high sharp ratios, will it continue? Just like looking at the two and a half percent inflation swap cap floor metric, here you'll wanna look at what does some of this alternative data say about rents? Is it going to rebound or are we going to continue to slide like the financial crisis? And right now it's on the fence. I wanna see 50 plus percent probabilities. If we get that, I think we'll see the two and a half percent CP.